Hallelujah. Somebody say praise the Lord. I love honesty in church. How about this? Anybody in the room going through something right now? You got a problem? Maybe some pain in your life? Here's the thing about worship. You don't, you don't praise because there's a breakthrough all the time. You have to, listen, you have to learn to praise through your pain, through your problems. I'm thinking about Acts chapter 16 where Paul and Silas were in prison. And you can make a decision when you're depressed. You can make a decision when you're in pain. You can make a decision in the midst of your problems. You can either run to God or run away from God. And I was just watching, I was just watching our worship team, and you have no idea, just the people on the platform, what they're going through. And you gotta, you gotta press through it. And people in the room, I, I was looking around, and I know some of the people in the room right now, you're, you're faced with the problem, you're faced with the challenge, and, and thank you for pressing through in, in the middle of it, not because our life is perfect. I mean, no, we're not gonna get perfect till we get to heaven. You're gonna have problems, you're gonna have pain. There's gonna be some difficult things that you'll go through, but we gotta make a decision. Are we gonna praise God through it? Because I mean, no, he is the answer, he is the solution. And, uh, or are we gonna give up? There's too many people giving up and God has been too good to us to give up on him. Come on, put your hands together, let's thank him. Let's praise him in the middle of our pain. In the middle of our prison, in the middle of our depression, we praise you, God. We worship you. We acknowledge you. We love you. We serve you. We glorify you. We exalt you. We give you praise. We give you praise in the middle of our pain. We give you praise. We give you praise. We love you, God. And God, we declare today that a breakthrough is coming. God, by faith, we declare miracles, miracles are happening in Jesus' name. We praise in the middle of our pain. We praise in the middle of our problems. We know that you're a faithful God. We thank you, Lord God, that you're coming through for your people. So we, God, I just speak, Lord God, a spirit of perseverance over this house in Jesus' name. We will not give up. We'll keep putting our hands to the plow. We will not look back because when we look back, we're not fit for the kingdom of God. God, have your way in and through us, we pray, for your glory in Jesus' name. And somebody shout hallelujah. Come on, put your hands together. Praise God. What's up? What's up? Just got back from Spain on Friday night. Uh, it, was, it was an amazing time. We took four or five people from our church, my oldest daughter, and uh, man, what tough soil. Only 2% of the entire country is Protestant or evangelical. And I got to preach at a church last Sunday and met with a bunch of leaders. We have a great relationship that we've begun, and we're going to be taking teams back. It was awesome. We're right on the southern tip of Spain, suffering for Jesus. <laughs> it's good to be back. How many love Jesus with all your heart? Amen. Why don't you high five somebody as you're being seated there? You seem a little fired up. How many are fired up for Jesus? Amen. Amen. How many were at church last week? You didn't even know I was gone because some of you missed church. It's gone for 10 days and it's good to be back in the house of the Lord. In the house of the Lord. Are you happy about who you're sitting next to? You want to make a change right now? How many are saying, I'm good? How many want to make a change? Raise your hand. Ushers, help these people out. I didn't choose this person. Ready to study the Bible. All right, grab your copy of the Word of God and turn to the book of Ephesians. I'm doing a standalone message. That means that it's not part of a series. Steelers, you guys play tonight at 5 o'clock. I pray for a spirit of confusion on the Steelers right now in the name of Jesus. I'm a Cincinnati Bengal fan, so... Don't give me that. Ephesians chapter 2, you got it? How many are ready to talk about something amazing, something powerful? One of the greatest themes in all of the Bible is found in Ephesians chapter 2. And if you're ready, just make some noise. I love, I, love, I love the Word of God. The Bible says in the book of Hebrews chapter 4 verse 12, look at me. The Word of God comes to, it says it's sharper than any two-edged sword. 
It can divide that between that which is spirit and that which is flesh. How many know that uh, although we're spirit, man, we're also carnal and fleshly. And, and the Word of God comes and it just like dissects our attitudes and our motives. And, and the Bible says that God has given us His Word to correct us. How many need a little correction? Sometimes we think the wrong things and we come to church and open up the Word of God and just like, boom. You ever heard like a message or read something in the Bible and just penetrated your heart? You're like, oh, I got to make a change. That's why we came to church. I got to make a change. I got to be, I got to be a better husband and a leader than I was last week, last month, last year. Anybody else out there? Don't say amen for me. Say amen for yourself. And so God's Word comes to change us and correct us and rebuke us so the man or the woman of God might be complete. Amen. So I'm excited about preaching about grace. Someone say grace. grace. I've been telling the other services, I read a true story this last week. True story. How many have ever been on a cruise before? Cruise, 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 cruise. And you gain like 10 pounds on the cruise and True story, this happened a few years ago, but a, a guy, uh, he was kind of poor, he didn't have a whole lot of money, but he's always had like a lifelong dream to go on a cruise, and so for many months and years, he saved up his money to go on a seven-day cruise, I think it was in the Bahamas, and so he finally got enough money, bought his cruise ticket, and uh, he just went solo, I don't know if he wasn't married or whatever, but he goes on a cruise ship, and because he didn't have a whole lot of money left over, just enough to pay for the cruise, he made himself, true story, 21 peanut butter and jelly sandwiches, and so that he would have enough uh, food when he was on the cruise. So for breakfast, lunch, and dinner for seven days, you're laughing, aren't you, if you've been on a cruise? You're like, what is he doing, man? He's an idiot. Well, anyhow, true story. Seven days, uh, 21 peanut butter and jelly sandwiches. And so breakfast, lunch, and dinner, day one, day two, day three, day four. And he was watching everybody else go to the buffet, watch everybody else eat, watch everybody else get ice cream, watch everybody else get drinks. And uh, after like day six or seven, a guy came up to him and said, I got a question. Why, why are you, uh, why did you bring peanut butter and jelly sandwiches? And he said, well, to be honest with you, all I could afford was the cost of the cruise. Well, let's all do it together, ready? Oh, yeah. And he go, and, and the guy said, I don't know if you know this, but when you pay for the cruise, you get everything else with it. The buffet comes with it. The ice cream comes with it. The sodas come with it. It all comes. And I wonder how many people are in church today. You're saved. You're going to heaven. But you don't understand that God has way more for you than just eternal life. How many know that God has joy for you, peace for you, hope for you, strength for you, wisdom for you? He has way much more than just a ticket to heaven. Do not pass, go, do not collect $200. I'm glad that you're going to heaven. I'm glad that I'm going too, but God has way more in store for you. Turn to somebody and say, God's got more for you. Come on, make some noise to the person on your right and left and say, God's got more for you. You're way more in store. God says the joy of the Lord is your strength. God has peace for you, a peace that surpasses any understanding. I'm already preaching. I haven't even read the text yet. And God's got wisdom for you you. The Bible says if you lack wisdom to ask of God, Jesus said the thief has come to steal, kill, and destroy, but I have come to give you abundant life. So it's not just about the sweet by and by. It's about the nasty here and now. God has more for you. Let's all declare it out loud. Say, God has more for me. Come on, sit. Do you believe that God has more for you? And so we're going to talk about something I'm excited about, about grace. What is grace, Pastor Steve? Well, grace is God's unmerited favor. In other words, you don't deserve, I don't deserve the grace and the mercy of God. How I many know we don't deserve it? Turn to the neighbor you don't like that much and just say, you don't deserve it. You don't deserve it. So you ready? Here we go. Three principles regarding grace. Ready? And is it okay if we do it? Here's what we're going to do. I'm just going to lay out where we're going for the next 30 or 40 minutes. Ready? Ready? How about this? How about a little shorter message? Typically, I'll preach 40 to 45 minutes. And uh, let's go a little shorter, like 30. And then on the back end, I think it'd be awesome to celebrate this amazing God who is grace. And we're going we're gonna to sing a couple songs. And I'm going to tell you right now, at the end of the message, I'm going to give an invitation for anybody in the room that's never begun a relationship with Christ. It's going to be awesome. It's already been awesome in all three services. We've had probably close to 100 people in three services give their life to Christ. Come on, let's put our hands together. So that is where we're going today. We're going to probably be out of here about 150 or 155. Okay, is that okay? Okay, so we're just going to let God do what he wants to do. The Holy Spirit's going to move. He's going to change people's lives. It's going to be awesome. Ready? You don't seem ready. All right, so here we go. Three things, and they're very simple. Number one, in your notes, write this down. Number one, you were. You were. Were. What do you mean you were? Well, let's read verses 1 through 3. Ephesians chapter 2, uh, the Apostle Paul writing to the church at Ephesus said, As you, as for you, here it is, underline this in your neighbor's Bible. Uh, as for you, it says, you, what does it say? You 
were dead in your transgressions and sins in which you used to live when you followed the ways of the world and of the rule of the kingdom of the air, the spirit who is now at work in those who are disobedient. All of us lived among them at one time, gratifying the cravings of our flesh and following its desires and thoughts. Here it is. Like the rest, we, we what? We were by, by nature children of wrath. Check this out. How many have kids, like elementary kids? Raise your hand. Did, did you ever have to teach your kids to be selfish? So they had like a toy or something, and they're out on the playground with the ball, and the other kids say, give me the ball. And one of the kids takes the ball from them, and they say, mine. Did you have to teach your kid to be selfish? No. By nature, kids are selfish. And let me just add this. By nature, adults are selfish as well. That's what it says. At, by nature, all of us are selfish and sinful. So check this out. If you are here today and you're a believer, you know that you know that you know that you're a Christian, raise your hand right now. I know that I know, okay? But check it. Here's the good news, ready? Before I came to Christ in 1985, my spiritual condition, according to Ephesians chapter 2, is that I was, we were, dead in our transgressions and sin. The Bible says in Romans 6, 23, for the wages of sin is what? Death. But the gift of God is eternal life in Jesus Christ. The wages. Someone say wages. Do you have a job? How many have a job? Okay. So for the 40 hours that you put in, you get a wage or a paycheck right? For services rendered. So for putting in hours at your office, you get a wage. Check it out. What is the wage that you and I get for sin? The wages, the paycheck for sin is, it's not necessarily talking about physical death. It's talking about spiritual separation from God. One sin separates you and I from God. True. Before we came to Christ, we were dead. We were dead. How many have ever been to a funeral, even recently? Been to a funeral? There's some crazy things that happen at funerals. I've done a lot of them. You want to hear about the first funeral I ever did? I graduated Bible college maybe a couple months after Bible college, 24. I didn't know really anything. And I could tell you it was out in Ventura, and the funeral was over. And they don't do this anymore, but they started lowering the casket with the dead body. And the grandmother jumps on top of the casket. She's like three feet under. No! And I'm just like standing back there like, what do I do? They didn't teach me into Bible college what to do. I don't know what to do. This is weird. And we're trying to get the grandma off, and it was crazy. I, I did another funeral, and the guy, you know that eulogy part where people come up and say crazy things? And so eulogy just means to say a good word about, and people just like, they're not used to talking. But one time, this guy was really drunk. And so the, the deceased person was in the casket. The guy gets up, and he just starts blasting the dead guy. He was a jerk, and all you guys are getting up here saying he was awesome. I hated that guy. I, was just like, I, I had to pull him off of the stage. Crazy. I've seen some crazy things at funerals. I've, now, let's just imagine right now we're at a funeral service, not a church service, although it, sometimes it feels like a funeral service when I'm preaching. <laughs> you ever been at the first service? You should come. And, uh, uh, don't, don't tell them, but anyhow, we're in a funeral service right now, right? And let's just imagine that there's a casket here with Bill in it, and he's, is he alive? He's He's dead. And so what if I got up as the pastor and I said, hey, uh, everybody, Bill's just having some issues right now. <laughs> He's got a couple challenges, and I think if we can get him some counseling, maybe he needs to call the church, we get him some counseling, he might turn his life around. Or if he can go to like a Tony Robbins seminar, or maybe a self-improvement course, uh, he, might, he might snap out of it. You'd be looking at me like, dude, what is Pastor Steve smoking? Somebody spiked the communion juice. What is he saying? The guy doesn't have challenges. He doesn't have issues. He's, he's dead. Check it out. If you do not know Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, you can't look to a time in your life, and I'll talk about this in a second. According to the Bible, you are dead. Your heart is beating. You're here physically, but you are dead. You are dead. And that was our condition before Jesus Christ. All of us in the room, we were, we were dead. By nature, deserving what? Wrath. I have to do this all the time. The wages of sin is death. All, raise your hand if you're all, all fall short of the glory or the standard of God. I have to do this like every month. How many have ever coveted before? Get your hand up right now. Here's what I mean. Coveting means that you wish you had something that somebody else has. You're driving your little stupid smart car and somebody, somebody at your office pulls in in a brand new Mercedes and you're like, I hate my car. I wish I had their car. I wish I had their spouse, their job, their house, their, that's coveting. So according to the Bible, you are a coveter and you fall short of the glory of God. How many have ever lied? Raise your hand right now. 
You didn't raise your hand. Get it up right now. Just, you just lied by not raising your hand. Yeah, yeah. Now you're a liar and you're a coveter. How many have ever stole something like a pen from our church? <laughs> Steal. You, you are a thief, coveter. How many have ever committed adultery? Don't raise your hand. <laughs> Some people in the room have. You're like, well, I've never done that except, ready? Jesus said, if you've ever looked at someone lustfully, you've committed adultery. Every man in the house is an adulterer. So God gave us the Ten Commandments to prove that we can't keep them. That was the point of it. Why? Because we all fall short of the glory of God. Here's the tendency that we have. Ready? Look at me. The tendency for me is that I look at other people, I'm like, I'm better than them spiritually, and I can judge them and look down on them and say, at least I'm not a rapist. At least I'm not a, I've never, my, my wife never had an abortion. At least I'm not as bad as, I've never robbed a bank. I was never in a gang. I've never done drugs. And if I'm not careful, if we're not careful, we, we, we want to act like we're better than other people. No, here's the problem. When I was uh, flying back from Spain, I noticed that our plane was 37,000 feet up in the air. You ever looked at your plane at 37,000 feet and it looks like, you can look at a huge field, it looks like a little dot. In other words, if you're 37,000 feet up in the air right now and we look down upon the church, how many of you know, if you were stand, Pastor Tracy stood up, go ahead and stand up right there, and I'm up on the platform and if you look down at 37,000 feet, how many of you know that her and I look like we're on level ground? Because what, you're so high up, thank you. So check this out, you might appear to be better and higher than other people, but when the holiness and the highness of God looks down on all of us, we all fall short of the glory of God. You ready for some good news? Number one, you were, here's the great news. Number two, but God. We were dead, verse four says, but, but what? But God, not but Pastor Steve, not but you, not but me, not but elder so-and-so, but God. But because of his great love for us, God who is rich in mercy, New King James, like it, it says this, but God who is rich in mercy because of his great love with which he loved us, but God, say those two words with me, but God. Aren't you glad that God butted in your life? And God changed you and God saved you? Where would we be if but God didn't step in? Listen, but God saved us and reconciled us and delivered us and rescued from the penalty of sin. You know those two words, but God, can solve any dilemma, can renew any heart, can change any scenario, can reverse any situation, can restore any marriage, can cancel any sickness, can rehabilitate any addict, can break any stronghold, can rescue any sinner, can overcome any obstacle, can mend any mess, can fix any family, can repair any life, but God. And I love this. Verse 4 says, but God who is, no, it's a, in his great love, not just love, not, not just for God so love, but what, how, what is this love like? It's great. It's awesome. It's amazing. I love that the love of God is great. First time I remember my little, my son, he was, he's 21 right now, but he was like eight or nine. I remember the first time, do you remember the first time your kid hit a home run in softball or baseball? I could tell you where I was. Right across the street from Bible Fellowship on Johnson Drive, there's a couple of Little League fields, and it was the smallest field, and, and my son got up to bat, and we've been like hoping and praying that he would hit a home run, and this was the day. So he gets up to bat, and the pitcher throws, and he hits the ball, and the ball, I can tell you, it, was, it went just like this. Here's the fence, and the, the ball hits the top of the fence, and it's like literally like teetering. I'm like, come on, come on, and it just kind of dropped over. You're like, what did you do? I went like insane. I was running up and down the sidelines, like, yeah, that's awesome. I was hugging people I didn't know. I was high-fiving people. I gave the umpire a big kiss. I'm like, oh, you're awesome. And I was just acting like crazy. Why? It's just the father's love in response to his son. Check this out. You know that God doesn't wake up every day. He doesn't wake up because he's always awake. But, you know, he doesn't, like, pop up and say, hey, 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 if you hit a home run today, I'm going to love you. But if you strike out, I'm not going to love you. You know there's nothing you and I can do today or tomorrow that's going to make, you God, make God love us anymore. And check this out. You can't, you can't fall into sin. You can't do something nasty in a week or a month that's going to change the love of God because his love is not predicated on our performance. It's predicated on the performance of Jesus Christ. So check it out. We were dead, good news, but God stepped in. I'm so grateful that in 1985, where would I be if God didn't step in? We'd be bankrupt, we'd be divorced, we'd be an addict, we'd be incarcerated, we'd be in prison, we'd be hopeless and lost if God. Listen, God sent his son, Jesus Christ, not to make good people better. He came to cause dead people to come to life. But God, come on, let's put our hands together and thank him that he intervened. But God, we were, but God, 
Number three, ready? This is the best part of the sermon. Number three, by grace. Write that down, by grace. How did it happen? By, check out verse five. You're like, where'd you get that? In the Bible. Verse five, he made us alive together with Christ when we were dead in transgressions. It is, it is, next two words, how? By grace you've been saved. And God raised us up with Christ and seated us with him in heavenly realms. Stop. Do you know where you are right now? Yeah, I'm sitting in the fourth service at New Life on Rice and Mulhart. No, you're not. Physically, that's where you're at. But the Bible says that if you're a Christian, you are seated with God in heavenly places. So physically, you're in a building on Mulhart, but check it out. Positionally, spiritually, you're seated with Christ in heavenly places. I don't have the time to unpack that, but let's keep reading in verse 6. And God raised us up in verse 7. In order that in the coming ages he might show the in, in, incomparable riches of his, of his what? Grace. Expressed in his kindness to us in Christ Jesus. For here, here it is. It is by grace. Verse 5. It is by grace. Verse 8. By grace. How is it? By grace. I was raised in a half Italian home and we were very kind of affectionate with each other. How many had kind of an affectionate family? I'm talking in a healthy way. We like hug, we just hug. And, and when you see relatives, you kiss them and stuff. In fact, when we were in Spain, uh, Spain, they kiss, they kiss you on one side of the cheek and then on the other side. It's really, if you're looking for a boyfriend or girlfriend, it's awesome, but, um, <laughs> but, but I'm not. So anyhow, but um, so, uh, you know, there's some, there's some weird huggers. You know what I'm talking about? Um, so we were taught as kids, hugs, not drugs. Um, but there's some people in our church, you're, they're awkward. When you've ever hugged like somebody and they, they kind of, they're all, and then they kind of get to the side of you, you're like, well, that was weird. And, or you go to hug them and like, you go on this side and they do the same, like, no, just like, and have I told you like the most embarrassing, because I see people in our church everywhere I go, like I'll go out to lunch after, there's going to be a ton of people. And so I just assume everybody goes to the church. So when my kids were younger, the, their elementary school was across the street. And this is silly, but I was like 40 years old, and I used, to, I used to let the dog pull me on the skateboard, and I'd walk the kids across and pray for them. And then, so I went up to this guy. He looked really familiar, and I gave him a big hug. I'm like, hey, how you doing? And he's just like, it's like, dude, man, you're so rude. You go to our church. It's Pastor Steve. And he's like, no, no, no. So I kind of hugged him, and he kind of, You've ever done that? You try to hug somebody, it's like mannequin. They're hugging, you're hugging a mannequin. And uh, someone just like, okay, God bless you. And then I got on, I was on the skateboard and I went back to my house. And like, when I was like, I just made a turn, jumped on my skateboard. And I'm like, oh my goodness. He doesn't go to the church. <laughs> he was our mailman. <laughs> so I'm like, hey, bud. He's like, he's probably thinking, wow, that guy's affectionate. And, uh, it was a super awkward hug, though. You're like, no, duh. But uh, you've ever hugged somebody like that? And they're just like, and sometimes people do that. When, when I say God loves you and he's a gracious God, some people are like, they kind of push away. No, no, he loves you. He's committed to you. For God so loved the world. Hey, that... Seven billion people on the planet, but check this out. For God so loved Steve. For God so loved Mike. For God so loved Shamble. Put your name there. God loves you. There's nothing you can do to change his radical love. And check it out. It's by grace that we're saved. Verse 8 and 9 says, not of works, lest anyone should boast. Check it out. When you get to heaven, when I get to heaven, I guess we're going to see Peter. Everybody always says he's going to be at the pearly gates. And so I'm going to get there and he's going to say, why do you deserve to get in? And I'm going to be like, what are you talking about? I'm like, incredible. We took our church from 40 people to 4,000 people. Of course, I've been preaching for the gospel for 40 years. That's not how it's going to happen. It's not about how, how many times you go to church, how often you read the Bible, how many verses you have memorized. It's by grace. There's nothing that I've done. There's nothing that you've done to deserve the grace of God. There's nothing you de you've done to deserve God loving you. There's nothing you deserve to give you access and entrance into heaven. How is it? It's by, it's by grace. So the Bible says we all fall short of the glory of God. The wages of sin is so check out, one sin prevents us from getting to heaven. Do you know there's only two plans, two ways to get to heaven? Number one, plan A, it's phenomenal. It works all the time and it's grace. It's grace. It's through the person of Jesus Christ. The second way, here it is. 
People ask me all the time, Pastor Steve, can you tell me the difference? Because I have some friends that are Jehovah's Witnesses. I got a mom that's a Mormon. I've got a so-and-so relative that's a Muslim. What's the difference between Christianity and every other world religion? Ready? Let me illustrate it this way. Every other world religion says these two letters, D-O. Do. You got to do, knock on some doors. You got to share your faith with somebody. You got to pray certain prayers. You got to give a lot of money. You got to go to church. It's all about D-O. Do. You got to do certain things. Christianity separates itself because it's not what we need to do. It's about Jesus Christ coming down to the earth. And he, when he died on the cross, he says, it is finished. It's not D-O. It's D-O-N-E. It's already done. It's by grace. Otherwise, verse 8 and 9 says that we could boast about it. And check it out. We get no credit for it. How is it? By, by what? By, by grace. By grace. So let me ask you the question, which plan are you on? Are you on the grace plan or are you on the works plan? This sounds awesome right now. What if, like tonight, we all went to Fiji? Wouldn't that be great? So LAX, 7 o'clock p.m., headed to Fiji. We all jump on the airplane. We're going to Fiji. We're going to hang out on the islands for a week. But inadvertently, you get on a different plane. You get on a plane going to Chicago. <laughs> Have fun. How many know on that plane, you could be the most sincere person? On that plane, you could sit in first class. You could help out the flight attendants while you're on that plane. But check it out. The goal, the destination is Fiji, and you are stuck in the windy city because you're on the wrong plane. you got to be on the right plane. And Jesus said, hey, it's narrow. The, the way to eternal life is narrow. It's only through the person of Jesus Christ. Why, why, why does so many people get bothered when you say he's the only? Jesus said, I am the way. I mean, oh, that's narrow. And why is it okay to be narrow in every other field, but when it comes to theology and eternity, people get bent out of shape? Hey, if you go in for a surgery, don't you want the doctor to be narrow when he's cutting you open? Or do you want him to say, I think this is the organ I'm supposed to take out? You ever been to the doctor and you got a prescription and you took that prescription to the pharmacist? Don't you want the pharmacist to be narrow when he's giving you some medicine? You don't want him to say, I think this is what you should take. And when I'm on an airplane, I want the pilot to be really narrow. I don't want him to say, I think these are the buttons I'm supposed to hit. I want him to be narrow. And the same thing is true theologically as it relates to doctrine. There's one way. The Bible says, wide is the way to eternal destruction. There's a lot of people on it. Narrow is the way to eternal life and only a few find it. Because they're, they're doing the works thing, and it's by, it's by what? Grace. Solely by the grace of God. I'm losing my voice, but I'd like to sing, What can wash away my sin? Nothing but the blood of... Sing it out. What can make me whole again? Nothing but the blood of That's it. Nothing, not my works, not my prayers, not my church attendance, not my giving money. Hey, I, I gave some money to Haiti too on top of my tithe. No, nothing but the blood of Jesus Christ. It's simply by grace. Do you know, I know, if you're a Christian, I know every single testimony in this church. Remember, I, I've said this. Here's your testimony, ready? Like me, you were going, living your life, thinking you didn't need to, God, too sexy for your shirt. Just awesome, I'm incredible, I get this great job. And then God dropped a boulder on top of your head, got your attention. You're like, man, I need Jesus. That's everybody's testimony. The boulder is different. For some it was deep depression, for some it was bankruptcy, for some it was a divorce, for some it was loneliness, for some it was a loss of a job, for some it was incarceration. But God used that boulder because you were too sexy for your shirt. He dropped it on your head to get your attention to let you know that it's not uh, out of your works. It's simply by the grace and the mercy of God. And check it out. The Bible says, look at this verse, John, uh, uh, Romans chapter 3, verse 24. Yet, but God in his grace freely makes us right in his sight. He did this through Christ Jesus when he freed us from the penalty of our sins. Those, in his grace, freely. Someone say freely. freely. So let's just imagine Stephen and Genesis were going to come to my house tonight for dinner. We invited them over. It's not going to happen because I'm still jet lagged, but illustration. Another time, we'll take you up. 
So they come to our house for dinner, and I make them steak and lobster, and we, we have dessert together and, and cheesecake, and I make a couple cappuccinos. We had a wonderful time together, and they, they get out of the house at like 9 o'clock, and we lobster and steak and cappuccinos and cheese. Sounds good, doesn't it? Especially at 1.30 when I haven't eaten all day. And uh, at the end of the day, they're about to walk out the door, and I said, oh, I forgot to tell you. It's $100 each. <laughs> I mean, not, not too exciting now. What? I thought it was... I thought it was, it is, well, no, it's $200 a couple, right? And no, that God's grace, God's mercy, salvation is, it's free. It's free. How many have ever gotten a gift some, from someone and you, you acted like it was awesome? <laughs> you like, you open it up, oh, thank you, oh, it's beautiful. Yeah, another bow tie, that's great. <laughs> a scale. <laughs> yeah, are you telling me something? Yeah, a scale, that's great. Come on, how many ever got a, like a gift and you, you lied? Raise your hand. I got my hand up. And, uh, and so what do you do? You put it up on the shelf and you never bring it out till they come back again. <laughs> you know, I love the bow tie. It's awesome. And uh, how come you've never worn it? I don't know. Um, you ever got a gift and, hey, God's given us the free gift of salvation. He's like, here, here, here you go. It's free. It doesn't cost you anything. People are like, no, nah, I don't want it. Look at this, Romans chapter 10, verse 9 and 10. So grace is free, but check this out. If, notice the words that are bold here, if, if what? Confess with that Jesus Christ is Lord and believe in that God raised him from the dead. We just stop there. In heaven, there's not like a a family turnstile. Okay, Abraham's, you're all in. No, I had to make a decision. My wife had to make a decision. My daughters had to make a decision. My son had to make a decision. If I, if you, believe in your heart, confess with your mouth, you will be saved. It's by believing in your health that you are made right with God. And it's by confessing with your mouth that you are saved. Do you get it? You, 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 you. So it's a free gift. It's a free gift. How many, you do not have one of these New Life Awesome mugs? Do not. Why don't you have one? You don't have one. Come on, raise your hands. Anybody on the front row right here? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Eight, nine. No, 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 no. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. Yes. Ven aquí, por favor. Pretty good, huh, for a white guy. Come on. She does not have one of these mugs, and this is her gift from me. Let me ask you a question. What did she do to deserve this? She, I, I did peek over during worship. She, she, this girl knows how to worship. But I, she didn't, her worship was awesome, but it wasn't worthy of giving her this. She's here all the time, but she did nothing to deserve this. It's a gift that I want to give to her, but she needs to come up out of her chair and, so I just want to ask you, when you have your, do you like coffee? Awesome. So when you have your coffee in the morning, just remember to pray for me and my wife and our church and my kids, because raising kids is really difficult, especially our kids. So so what did she do to deserve it? She said to come in. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Enjoy the gift. Um, So God's like, my son, here's my son, Jesus Christ. He died on the cross for you. It's free. Eternal life is free. You can't work for it. You don't deserve it. You can't earn it. Did she just break that? She did break it. That is awesome. That is so awesome. Okay, so take, yeah. We have a backup right here. That is so awesome. And that's what we do with the free gift of eternal life. We break it. But praise God that we're gracefully broken. There you go. That's, that's all we have now. You're on your own. (laughs) Be careful. Be careful. (laughs) Help her out there. Help her out. Gracefully broken. Here I am, Lord. That was awesome. (laughs) Let's not use the fourth service for the uh, podcast. We'll use the third, so. You, 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 your, your, your. God says, hey, I've got my son. He died on the cross for you. So I was raised 
Catholic church, 19 years, I never received the gift. You got to receive it, you got to open it up. It's the greatest gift. I don't deserve it, I don't earn it. It's reckless love of God. So here's what I want to do with your heads bowed and eyes closed. If you're here today and either you've walked away from the Lord, you know that you know that you know that you've walked at one time, you were on fire for God, you were living for Him, and you've just been really complacent in your walk with Jesus Christ. Life is really, really fragile. It's like a vapor. We're not guaranteed tomorrow. Maybe you've never opened up to the love of God. Again, I told you my testimony. 19 years I went to church off and on, but I never had, I had religion. I didn't have a relationship with Jesus. In fact, you know that if Jesus was against anything in the New Testament, he was against religious people. Because religion is all about D-O. These are the things I have to do. Relationship is, it's D-O-N-E. God says, I want a relationship with you. So we've been having a great time in our three services. This is number four. I'm going to give you an opportunity. If you've never responded to the love of God, it's a free gift. In fact, the Bible says that God's knocking on the door of your heart right now. He's not going to force a relationship, but he wants you to have it. Jesus said in John 3, 3, you must be born again to enter the kingdom of God. Let me ask the question, when did you do that? I can tell you in October of 1985, that's when I did it. When did you do it? You have to know, just like you know that you're married, just like you know you have kids. You should be that much more sure of a supernatural relationship with Jesus. I'm not saying you got to know the day or the time or the hour, even the month. There has to be a time where you can look back on your life and say, you know, I was dead in my trespasses, but God intervened. I gave my life to Jesus Christ, and my life has never been the same. So when was that for you? And if you don't know or you can't look back to a time where you know that you know, today is your day. September 30th, 2018 is your day. Today is the day of salvation. And we do this a lot of different ways. We have people come forward. We have people go into the prayer room. We have people close your eyes, lift up your hand. Here's how we're going to do it today. If you know that you know that you know you need Jesus, I'm going to ask you right now to stand to your feet. We've had probably 75 to 100 people do it in three services. Well, if I stand up, what are people going to think? Who cares what people think? We're here to be God pleasers, not man pleasers. So if you're serious about your eternity, if you're serious about opening up the gift of salvation and receiving Jesus by grace, I'm not even going to wait. I'm going to ask you right now, would you go ahead and stand to your feet all over the building? Each section, come on, I know there's a lot of people you need to stand up. Some of you don't know Jesus personally. Some of you have walked away all over the building right now. Today is your day. The Bible says if you hear his voice, do not harden your heart. This is your day. Your life is going to change today. I believe there's more people in this section right here that need to stand to your feet. There's moms and dads, there's parents, there's young people, boys and girls, you need to stand to your feet. Today is your day. Don't let this day slip. I'm telling you, accidents happen, emergencies happen, people die. Middle section, stand to your feet right now. Today is your day to receive Jesus. He's going to radically transform and change your life. People in this section, I agree with you. All of you that are standing right now, I don't know your story, but I do know your story. That God's intervening right now. God's intersecting. But God, you were dead in your trespasses and sin by nature. You are a sinful person like I am, but God stepped in today. And I'm telling you, by grace, by grace, you're saved. We rejoice with you. I don't know most of you that are standing. God knows you. He knows your past. He knows your struggles. He knows your problems. And he loves you in spite of you. I'm going to invite those that are part of our prayer team if you would make your way to the front. And I want to thank every person that's standing right now. It takes a lot of courage and boldness to do that. But here's what I believe. If you're not willing to stand up in front of people that love Jesus in a church service... It's going to be really difficult to do that outside at school or at work. So thank you for standing with boldness. You're like, what do you want me to do next? Here's what I want you to do. In a second, I'll tell you when. But I want you to, in just a minute, I'll tell you when to do it, to get out of your seat. In fact, if you're with somebody, and maybe they already go to our church, they're already a Christian, maybe you want to ask them, hey, would you come forward with me? Maybe you're a little nervous, you don't know what to expect. I'm going to invite you to bring your belongings with you. But I want you, in just a second, I'll tell you one, to get out of your seat. 
and make your way forward. And you're, you're going to find one of these prayer people. And it might mean, because there's probably 40 people that are standing, it might mean that four or five of you are going to go to one person or one couple. And they're going to pray with you. And they're going to agree with you. And they're going to give you a little packet to help you in your journey with Christ. And you're like, what's well, a little scary? And what are people all around me going to think? I, I know what they're thinking. They think that you're awesome. They think that you're courageous. In fact, in a second, hold on. In a second, when you come forward, they're going to start applauding your decision because they know that your life will never, ever be the same. So I'm going to invite you right now. Make your way out of your seats. Ask the person if you need to say, hey, can you please move? I need to come. Grab your purses. Grab your Bibles. Come forward. The rest of us stand to our feet. Let's put our hands together. And let's thank God for these that are coming forward. Come on. Get out of your seat. Move forward. Move forward. Come down to the front. Come down to the front. Come on, let's put our hands together. Come on, make some noise.